Hey everybody, my name is Joey Jorison from the band Vimic and also the band Sinsanum, and you're watching Loudwire. Hey everyone, Graham from Loudwire here, and it's Wikipedia Fact or Fiction time with, honestly, the most requested guest that you asked for, Mr. Joey Jordison. Thank you so much, man, for sitting down with me and doing this segment. So happy, giving the people what they want. All right, so first of all, they do get the basic stuff wrong sometimes, so uh, Nathan Jones Jordison, born in Des Moines, Iowa. Yep, born in Des Moines, Iowa. Nathan Perfect. Jonas. Jonas is my middle Jonas. name. Uh, see, it says Jonas. Yeah, it's his Jonas. J O N A S is my uh, middle see, name. Nathan some, Jonas Jordison, yep. Already some fiction. All right, so we got that one. Uh, said that some pseudonyms you've gone by in the past have been Speedball, Superball, and Scarecrow. Scarecrow and Speedball, no, but no. Superball, yes. Okay, so that's wrong. Uh, speedball, you said was correct? No, that's incorrect. Okay, Superball is right. Super Bowl is right. That was a nickname that I got in the early Slipknot days because I get myself so worked up. I was kind of like literally bouncing off the walls, and Sean from Slipknot, clown, yeah, he's yeah. like, "Man, you're like a you're like a Super Bowl," and it just ended up sticking, you know, with the crew and the band and everything. So that's how I got the nickname. It was a long time ago. This is like 1997, 98. Way back so, when. Yeah. All right. So there you go. More fiction and a little bit of fact. Uh, as your main influences, you cite Keith Moon. John Bonham, Peter Chris, Gene Krupa, and Buddy Rich. Very true. These are your um, main guys? Yeah. Um, that, that, and the reason I say that, that's kind of how I started. That's what got me into music like when I was really young. I'm talking about like, like when I'm five years old when I started playing music. I started on guitar around five. Yeah. And I transitioned to drums around seven. But I was still in classic rock. It wasn't until I heard Kiss Alive is when I started getting into... That, that, that was my first cassette I ever bought was Kiss Alive, just because of the cover. Yeah. And I was changed forever then. So, and from then, I just became completely in, engulfed in metal. Even though I wouldn't consider Kiss necessarily a metal band. Yeah. But to me, you know, going from like, you know, the Rolling Stones and the Who and stuff like that, it was. And then from then, it just like started moving on so when I started getting into the thrash scene. Awesome, awesome. Uh, it said that after your mom remarried, she set up a funeral parlor where you would occasionally help, yep. and you felt a responsibility at a young age to become the man of the house. Uh, partially true, partially not. Um, the thing is, like, I always take care of my family, I look after my family. Um, my stepfather passed away, he's the one that owned all the funeral homes once my mom remarried. And uh, yeah, we had, we had five funeral homes, and yes, I would occasionally help. Um, you know, with, with uh, the duties that encompass, you know, being owning businesses like that. And, and, and just like, you know, my, my whole family did as well. It's not just me, so I can't take total credit. But I just, you know, I would help out, and that was just part of our family business, you know. And, you know, my stepfather, Mike, God rest his soul, and all that stuff, you know, he passed away, and my mother sold the funeral homes and all that stuff like that. But yeah, that was a big part of my life at that time. Uh, it was around your younger days that you formed the band Mo Diff. Modifidious. Modifidious, thank you. Uh, and you, which you played drums. And you used to perform at a bowling center your family owned on a night called Rock and Roll Bowl. Correct, partially. Okay. Um, it, uh, the bowling alley was called Bolarama on the south side of Des Moines. Okay. And my uncle worked there, and my dad owned part of the part of the business and, and all that stuff. And yeah, that was that was a big part of uh, my growing up too, because like my old thrash bands, the, uh, my uncle used to have like rock and roll bowls on like Friday and Saturday nights where we'd actually set up on the lanes. Yeah. And like, you all, know, you'd play all, all, yeah, we play on the lanes while people bowling right next to us. Wow. You know? Yeah. That's so pretty yeah, sweet. yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, again, early thrash days. So yeah, it was killer. It said in March '94. After a recommendation from a friend, you got a job at a Sinclair garage in Irvindale. You worked the night shift, which you preferred because it left weekends free and days free so you could spend time with your friends and you enjoyed listening to music while working. Very, very true. Yeah. Uh, another reason is um, I got a recommendation from a mutual friend that worked there and uh, he was a metalhead as well. And so I would be practicing with my old band, like, Modifidius, and then, like, we would go down there, like, after hours, and we would just listen to metal, like, 10 to 8. And I'm like, this is just the raddest job ever. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the owner 
and manager Dwayne, um, you know, he was, you know, I asked him for a job because it was just perfect. I could listen to metal all the time, you know, work from like, I could go to band practice at six o'clock, you know, and go until like 9.30. Then I would go right to uh, Sinclair, listen to metal, and uh, all the guys in Slipknot would come down there and we'd just start mapping out yeah. everything that was going on, you know, or what we wanted to do, you know, from 1995, and I worked there until like about 97, and then things started taking off around 98. Awesome. Uh, it said uh, back in the day that Paul Gray formed a death metal band called Body Pit. Uh, he Correct. tried getting you to join, but you declined. Very true. Very um, true. Because I, the, the only reason is not that I did play some shows with Body Pit. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did. I did a few. Um, but the only reason I did not totally join Body Pit is because I, I had my own uh, thrash metal band sure. called Modifidius at the time. So right. it was hard to be at two places at once. And, you know, when you're in a band and you're forming and you're, you're really working hard at it and you're writing songs and stuff like that, you just don't jump ship. You know, I had to stay loyal to my band and stuff like that. But once all the bands, you know, started dissipating, they were doing it for a reason. And that includes, like, Heads on the Wall, which Sean was a part of, and, you know, Stone Sour, of course, which has been, you sure. know, of course, they're hugely successful now and being reinvented. You know, they all just, you know... You know, started uh, you know breaking up around this some point, and we just started uh, grabbing everyone we could that we knew that would uh, concoct. Like, I, in our opinion, at least all we wanted to be is like the biggest band in the morning, whatever we could do, and you know, it ended up working. And next thing you know, you know, yeah, we we you know we did well for ourselves. It says it was your idea to name the band Slipknot, and without a recording budget, the band's first demo ended up costing forty grand. Very true. Uh, um, the only thing is, I have to correct, it wasn't my total idea to call the band Slipknot. It was a band discussion, and it was a unified okay. thing. I did suggest it, and it was a conversation between between me and Sean Cran. And we were like, you know, because we, we were originally called the Pale Ones, and then we were called right. Meld, and then neither one of those names were really working, so we were kind of just spitballing in a band meeting, and like, yeah. it was just a suggestion. So yes, I would say definitely partially true, but without the rest, you know, without Sean Cran's input that we were talking about, because we were together all the time, late night, you know, watching TV and listening to music. Um, so like, I'd have to credit him as well. The Slipknot album, you and Ross Robinson mastered the album using only analog equipment. Very true. Wow. 100%. That's got to be a pain. Yeah. And uh, what's cool is like how we mix that record was we did it at Indigo Ranch, which is a pretty legendary studio. Uh, you know, first corn record, second corn records done there, first Limb Biscuit records done there. So, like, you know, in 1998, that was like a pretty big deal for us. So, Huge. when Ross, you know, found us and, like, you know, got us signed and we got our deal with Roadrunner, of course, we wanted to do it at Indigo. So, when we went there, you know, we did it on an analog board, which, you know, it was not automated like we have today. Right. Yeah. So and we, when uh, we got finished recording, me and Ross mixed that record. It was literally like me and him, like just crossing arms like this. Wow. And like we mixed it like, you know, just just by our hands. Like there was no automation, there was no computers, nothing. So it was just like me and Ross like crossing crossing arms all the time. So what and a it, trip. it just turned out killer. Wow. Yeah. Man. I mean like the first Slipknot record still, I would I would say every record holds a, a, a huge spot to me but without that record I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today so it's still probably my favorite record of all wow. I've ever done and to work with Ross too like what oh a, he's the what man a, what an awesome dude yeah, he's he is killer. I love him yep. the famous mansion uh, you had an unsettling experience in the base in the basement when you felt something touch you and subsequently you never went down there again where are you talking about well the famous Houdini mansion Oh, the, very true. Um, actually, it was it was upstairs. It wasn't downstairs. Okay, not yeah, it in the was, basement. It was upstairs. Uh, around around 5 a.m., 4, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. every night. And sometimes we'd be up late still mixing and stuff. I'd hear uh, my door would close. I had two doors in the room that I was staying up in the, in the top. Wow. And it would open just, you know, just without, like, you know, people would have to open the door. It's not yeah. like it was not closed or something. And, uh, you know, it would do that around 4, between 4 and 5 a.m., like, every morning. So it was really creepy, and that's a very true story, yep. Man. So uh, was was that a part of the house that you would, like, never go to again? Or? No, no, because, no, like, okay. I love it because Volume 3, that's where I lived making that record, and it was awesome. 
So wow. I, I'd love to revisit it, you know, someday soon. Yeah, it'd be in really cool. Just to, yeah, really wow. love to go back there and just, you know, hang out and like kind of just revisit those memories. Because when you make a record somewhere, every time you go back, you feel that presence, you know, like what you created and what you get to release to the world and everything. So it's been it's been awesome. Awesome. So a little bit of fiction in that one. Uh, it says that you consider Women and Children Last as really the first true Murder Dolls record. Correct. Yeah? Um, Beyond the Valley is great, but it was kind of like, I consider it a glorified demo, because I recorded that all myself, and we didn't do it with a producer. I produced it myself with an engineer in Des Moines. And, you know, I, I love that record. I love listening to it, but, you know, we didn't have a budget or anything, so, like, okay. it's basically just like a demo, and, you know, we get, you know, Roadrunner wanted to sign it and put it out, so we weren't doing nothing with Slipknot at that time. So, yeah, we put that out. But uh, I, I consider, um, you know, the Women and Children Last is actually the first Murder Dolls record. Gotcha. Uh, Sinsanum, uh, guitarist Frederick Leclerc, uh, who composed all the music on Echoes of the Tortured and co-wrote all the lyrics. He had some death metal demos, but his commitments to Dragon Force prevented him from seeing the light of day. The death metal demos, I guess. Uh, True and false. Okay. I, um, me and Fred, when we were touring with Slipknot and Dragon Force, yeah. came up with the idea of forming a death slash black metal hybrid type project. And a lot of bands, you know, they talk about, oh, you know, we need to do a side project sometime and they never come into fruition, sure. you know? But as far as like the composing, as far as like the music of Sinsanum, it is pretty much Fred's baby. You know, and but and and the lyrics are definitely Attila and, and Sean Z. Oh, of course. Yeah. But all the guys, you know, in in that band are amazing. I love Attila. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> that you. That guy is brilliant. Yeah, that 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 band is solid. Is I, I love that band because they really challenge me, and it's yeah. it's really killer. I really enjoy the interludes on that record too. Yeah. I, was, I thought it was really good. And I have to say hello to Stefan and Flo too, because the yeah. other two guys in that band they are amazing musicians. For sure, they're killer. Uh, and last one for you, Vimic, uh, open your omen. Although there's no release date yet, we'll see a release sometime in 2017. Partially true, partially false. Right now, we have a release date set. We don't know if we want to go through with it or not because we're signing a new deal right now. Gotcha. Because everything's being closed as we speak, like me and talking to you. I mean, we've been on emails today. So wow. everything's going really good. It's coming out. But that's what's good about being on tour is like we're just getting out to meeting the fans, showcasing what we're about, getting the music out there. And that's, you know, usually I'm not a big internet fan, but it's actually doing really good for us right now. So I think I've changed a little bit. All right. Cool. <laughs> but no, it, it's coming out and like it, it's. Um, you know the deal's getting signed already, and like we're we're it's getting put out. So awesome. Yep, it's, oh, on, it's on its way. So thank you so much, dude. Oh, thank you, dude. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Loudwire. Joey Jordison, everybody. Vimic, look out for Open Your Omen. It's coming soon. Look out for these guys. Will be on the road very soon on a very cool tour. Can't say exactly what it is yet. It's gonna be awesome. But it's gonna blow your mind, Joey. Thank you, man. Oh appreciate man, thank it. you. Thank you very much, guys.